Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by MarketFi. I'm your co-host, Joel Alconin, along with Dennis Dick. And we're getting another look from the floor here with Tim Anderson. He's a managing director at TJM Investments. Tim, you getting some snow out there? Yeah, we do. We got some really nasty, heavy, thick, six inches slush rain this morning depending on where you were coming in from it was uh not fun huh frankly it was worse than last week okay well we got a little bit <laughs> over here too so you and i were going back and forth a little bit last week and looking for topics and uh you showed me some nice looking charts here uh on high yield debt just give me those symbols and then uh talk us through your thesis here i think wasn't one of them jnk yes yes and the other one is hyg uh, and those are the two uh, most commonly looked at uh, high yield debt ETFs, uh, and I don't. I'm not going to get into exactly what the uh, structure of them all is, but okay. uh, basically, these are you know have been pretty good indicators the last couple of years of. Uh, preview of what the equity market might be doing over the next quarter or so. Now, they had been in a pretty sharp decline since the middle of the year, um, really accelerated on the downside in uh, December uh, when a lot of people started to get very concerned about how many uh, secondary and tertiary oil companies had a lot of high-yield debt that they might have problems with if in the world of uh, $50 oil. And they really looked like they they reached kind of a selling climax, maybe a final flush of tax loss selling in mid-December. They bottomed out right around the time the market bottomed out. But since then, they've recovered very nicely, and they look like they could be breaking that downtrend that they've been in for the last six to eight months. Now, they could also just be shrinking the spread a little bit from uh, what they yield to... Uh, high-grade corporates and treasuries, which which rallied very very sharply in the last uh, in the last two months, um, it's it's something that definitely investors and traders should be keeping a close eye on uh, the remain at least the remainder of this quarter. Um, it might be a positive indicator for the market if they can if uh, the HYG and the JNK can break their downtrends that they've been in for the last six months. Are they thought, what is your thoughts here, Tim, on the recent rally? Like, I watched that TLT here, and this thing has been making new highs, it seems like, every day. Um, and obviously, everybody who's been playing it from the yield game, thinking yields can't go lower, has been getting crushed in this thing. What are your thoughts here? Like, when, you know, do we find, you know, a, 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 a bottom here for yields? That's a very tough call, and you know, eighty percent of the people have been wrong on that for the last uh, year. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, uh, a great example of what you're talking about is look at how the the spread has shrunk considerably between the uh, the the Japanese ten year and the German ten year. Yeah. Um, you know, the German ten year was twice that, and, and clearly, a lot of uh, a lot of this is coming from. Um, the fact that every piece of data point that's come out the last uh, two months has shown uh, more disinflation or deflation or whatever term you want to put on it in uh, in Europe, uh, prices are going down. Um, that might be good for the consumer, but it's really not good for the economy overall. And you know, how, where do you go after you get so close to zero that there's not much left? <laughs> uh, astoundingly, some uh, sovereign debt has started to trade with a negative yield. Yeah, I'm not sure what possible? all the implications are of that. Like, like I, I think over in uh, Switzerland they were talking that we, we're starting to see negative yields here now. I mean, nobody thought that was possible. I know. I know. It's crazy. Um, but, you know, I mean, one of the big questions I have that nobody seems to be able to answer is, uh, the ECB is going to buy uh, or empower the uh, national central banks in the EU to buy debt as part of their QE program. 
are they going to bite that with a negative yield? Why well, would they? Why would they? I wouldn't. Why well, would one reason that they would is that there's some new capital rules on all of the banks in Europe. And they want the banks, you know, in, in one hand, they're, they're, these rules are coming out of the, uh, uh, a lot of them out of the Basel III um, recommendations. But uh, banks in Europe used to be able to carry uh, sovereign debt on their books without a capital requirement. That's no longer going to be the case. Um, so if they can sell, some, oh, if the banks can sell a lot of the sovereign debt that they have on their books to their uh, national uh, uh, central banks and free up any potential capital requirement that they'd have to carry that, that would put them in a position to be able to uh, lend and or buy other debt a lot more freely. About some of the, uh, some of the so European I, banks. I, I think that, the, you know, it, 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 it's going to it's going to prevent a lot of them from potentially having to do a very dilutive capital raise. Uh, Santander Bank did a capital raise maybe uh, your late third quarter, early fourth quarter. That sucks clearly, been under a lot of pressure despite the fact that uh, Spain is actually one of the most uh, uh, what well, has one of the highest rates of productivity uh, in in Europe. Uh, but I, I, I would as, as as much of a contrary trade as it seems like, I would keep a very close watch on the big, uh, on the on the on the on the European banks because they're going to be able to free up um, a lot of the, uh, their balance sheets quite a bit by selling a lot of the sovereign debt that they have on their books to uh, the central banks of whatever country they're domiciled in. All right, I have a chart up here of a Deutsche Bank here. Uh, you just give us your take on that. Good support at the twenty-eight dollar level, tight trading range. Yeah, it, it is, and you know the, the, the old, the old, the, you know, technicians will tell you that the, the longer you sit in a tight trading range, uh, sometimes the sharper the breakout gets. Now, I don't have that chart that you're looking at in front of me, but I mean clearly. Um, the the uh, German yeah, index, the DAX, has been made some new highs early in the week before things got really volatile toward the end of the week. There's no doubt that the situation in Greece casts a whole new spin of uh, uncertainty and potential volatility on the environment over there. But there are a couple of the you know that. The banks being able to free up, uh, sell a lot of their sovereign debt that they have on their books to uh, either the ECB or their uh, foreign national central banks it, it is a positive that would make you make you want to keep these stocks uh, front and center for a while because there could be a vicious trading rally in them if uh, some of the uncertainty clears a little bit from Greece. Well, Tim, just looking at these charts and trying to take a longer-term perspective here on the weeklies, I'm looking like Deutsche Bank, and you talk, and you know, SANs, the Banco Santander that you were just talking about. But even if I look at the other big European banks like Barclays, or I look at a Credit Suisse, all of these stocks are really trading near their lows, and I'm talking lows from the last multiple years, where you've seen a huge rally in the yep. U.S. banks, but you've not seen that in the European banks, and you're actually seeing the opposite thing happen lately. I mean, Credit Suisse has been breaking down here tremendously in the last uh, just in, since January is twenty six dollars. It's twenty one dollars here now. These European banks yep. look like some of them are in trouble. Yeah. Well, I think one of the fears, one of the one of the things that people have been talking about is that they're all going to have to do major capital raises. Yeah. And there's a chance that that scenario might not develop once. And I don't have you know I'm not I, I don't have. I don't have total clarity on it, but I've talked to a number of people about it, and they're going to be able to, you know, r rather than having to put up um, uh, a haircut on, haircut's not really the right word, rather they're going to have to put up uh, a, a, a collateral on all of the sovereign debt that they have on their books 
to carry that debt going forward, which is going to be one of the a, 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 a new capital regulation for them, they're just going to be able to sell a lot of that debt back to the uh, whatever foreign central bank in the EU is exercising the QE program with the backing of the ECB. Tim, let's, uh, let's... And that's going to help free up the capital position of a lot of those banks. Tim, let's uh, let's just take a look at the oil stocks here. Uh, wicked range here in crude today, $4 range all over the map. Uh, you did have ExxonMobil come out with good earnings. They rally this thing to eighty nine fifty and change, and now it's it's uh, it's trading red on the day. Is it? It. I mean, is it just stay away from these things until you get a sustained? Well, they've always reported good earnings. That's not that wasn't the issue. I mean, the, the issue is their guidance going forward, whether or not they're what they're going to do with their capex plan, and whether or not they're going to continue to uh, buy back stock if they have a stock buyback out there. The, 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 the guidance is really what is got the guidance is really the issue. Okay. Um, and I believe there was an article in uh, in uh, Wall Street Journal Money Beat this morning about how where uh, oil is down over fifty percent uh, the commodity uh, from from where it was at a certain point in time. The uh, S and P five hundred banking index. Uh, whatever that comprises of, I, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but those stocks are only down um, 28%. So, and, and, and clearly, with earnings forecasts for uh, 15 being lowered considerably for a lot of these uh, oil companies, um, their, you know, their, their, their forward PEs actually look a lot higher. So it certainly is very tempting to, to look for, you know, and, and they've gone through a couple of different phases. Um, you know, a month ago or so, they, they, they rallied much stronger than oil did, simply because at that point in time, oil stabilized. It looked like it was going to hold the, uh, the $50 level. Oh, we slipped a little bit below that. There was a very strong knee-jerk rally on uh, Friday going into expiration. I think that was that oil rally on Friday was fueled by the uh, Baker Hughes rig count showing the sharpest decline in 22 years. Um, it's e- e- There's no doubt there's going to be trading rallies in some of these names, but if you were doing that from a short-term trading perspective, I'd certainly have uh, have stops out there because... There, there's a, a lot of the real vanilla sellers might just lean onto them hard on, on, a, on, a, on a real lift on another 5% or so. Tim, what are your thoughts here? Just changing the subject for a second. I want to get your thoughts on the Shake Shack because this thing was absolutely crazy on Friday. Trading huge volume and the stock, you know, was, you know, the IPO price down $21 and the stock opens up at 47 uh, What happens, you know, uh, like on a stock like that? Can you just talk about it from like the floor? Like what's going on down there in, in, in a day like when you see a stock go up like that, like SHAK did? Look, they only sold 5 million shares. I mean, clearly. Um, this guy, Danny Meyer, there's a huge name premium attached to him. You know, he's got very, very high end landmark restaurants in, uh, in New York, uh, Union Square Cafe, uh, Gramercy Tavern, um, a few others. I mean, these have been wildly, you know, restaurants, you know, lifespan of a good restaurant in New York sometimes uh, is, uh, you know, three to five years. These restaurants have been around for 15 years. 20 years, maybe longer. Um, and, and they only sold a small amount of stock uh, on, a, on a valuation or a price basis. I think it's crazy. I mean, you know, what if they got, you know, it, it's easy to say it's based on growth because they've only got 50 uh, outlets. Wow. But, oh. you know, what are the guys that own, what are the, what are the people that own five guys got to be thinking? Yeah, you, you're and right. If they're not, if yeah. they're not writing up papers to do a deal right now, I would be. just on valuation, yeah. I'd be shocked. Yeah. yeah, We've been on the line with uh, Tim Anderson. He's Managing Director at TJM Investments. He's joining us here on Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Thanks a lot, Tim. Uh, we hope to speak to you again soon.